Hello, my name is Ola Svensson. I'm a professor in theoretical computer science, and I'm also the, the director of the doctoral school, so I look forward to uh, talking to you more closely later on. However, today I'm really excited to talk about my own research. Uh, so, as I said, I'm in theoretical computer science, so I'm mainly interested in questions like, what is the best possible algorithm? And here you can see an illustration of my work. So I worked a lot on travel assessment problem, and I want to understand how strong are the best convex relaxations we know for this problem. Another question that has really uh, catch my attention recently that I find very interesting is whether randomization can be used to significantly speed up computation or not. So today I will not talk about the traveling salesman problem, but I will talk about another fundamental and beautiful question that we like to study in computer science, and that's the matching problem. So here I have as an input a graph, and I, here in the example I have six vertices, and we would like to find a matching of maximum cardinality. In this example, it's easy to see that there is a matching of size three, and moreover, it's a perfect matching because every vertex is incident to exactly one edge. This is a special problem in computer science. Here I have uh, two uh, photos of two famous characters. The fa first one is Jacobi, who invented an algorithm for the bite potato case already in the 19th century. The second picture is of Jack Edmonds, who gave the algorithm for general graphs much later in 1965. His paper was incredibly influential, and he made a case that we should think of efficient computation as polynomial time computation. Since then, we have studied the matching problem in many models of computation, including monotone circuits, extended formulations, parallel algorithms, streaming algorithms, sublinear algorithms, online algorithms, and so on. And I would think it's fair to say that if TSP is the benchmark empty hard optimization problem, then P is the benchmark problem, the, the matching problem is the benchmark problem we like in P. In this talk, I will mainly talk about online algorithms for the matching problem, and at the end, I will touch a little bit on parallel algorithms. Okay, so let's start with a concrete example to motivate online algorithms for the matching problem. You go to Google, you search the best graduate school, you click the search button, you get your results. Here we can see that there's a lot of results that make perfect sense, except maybe the first one. We don't know that school. And this school was assigned here by an ad allocation, uh, by an online algorithm that makes ad allocation. Basically, it matches ads to search results. So if we look at this problem a little bit more abstractly, we can think of having the advertisers on one side, and then we have the search queries that arrive online. When a search query arrives online, we need to ass assign an appropriate ad to that search. So maybe here we have two choices. We could either assign Coca-Cola or Pepsi. We assign Pepsi. Then another search comes, is interested in either Pepsi or what this is Ribella. That's the Swiss soda which you will enjoy once you're here. Maybe we assign Rivella. Then someone is looking for furniture, so we assign an ad about Ikea and so on. So in this model, we have the advertisers already known on one side of the graph, and then the searches arrive online. And when a search comes, we make, need to make an immediate irrevocable decision on which ad to assign to that search. So more abstractly, we have the offline vertices, which correspond to the advertisers, we have online vertices, and when a vertex arrives, we have to make, decide, do we want to match this vertex? And if so, to who, which free neighbor should be matched? Maybe here we match it to the top one, then a new guy arrives, we match it to the top one, new guy arrives, we match it to the top one, and there comes another one. Now we cannot match this guy because his, his neighbor is already taken, and if you think about it, it would have been better to match this guy down here, because then we could also match this guy up here. But we cannot change our solution. So in this case, our algorithm recovered a matching of size three, whereas the optimal matching had size four. In other words, we recovered three-fourths of the optimal matching. And we did so without knowing anything about the future. Of course, we are not only interested in this instance, so we would like an algorithm that is guaranteed to work well for any instance. 
and that's called the competitive ratio of that. So an algorithm is C competitive if for any input sequence, it finds a matching M such that the size of the matching is at least C times the optimum. We recover three fourths of the optimum in this instance, but we would like an algorithm that is C competitive for a large, uh, large C as possible for any input sequence. So what would you do? What's a good strategy? A hint, if you, when you sit, see it, uh, this at home, maybe you would consider greedy algorithms, like uh, Gordon Gekko in Wall Street, he loves greedy. And what would that be in our case? Well, I match an arriving vertex to a neighbor if there is one. So I match if I can. So as an example, I have offline vertices. When this vertex arrives, I see that it has three neighbors, so I match it to one of them. Now another vertex could arrive and say, oh, I cannot match this guy anymore because he already is matched. So here you can see that of these two, whereas our matching is only of size one. If you think for a while, this is the worst thing that can happen to such a greedy algorithm. And it's a folklore theory in that greedy is one half competitive and you cannot do better by using deterministic strategies. So one half competitive ratio is the best possible you can get if you think of deterministic strategies. Can we do better if we allow ourselves to use randomization? So is there a better randomized strategy that in expectation recovers more than half of all? The answer is yes. It was proven by a very influential paper by Kapp, Vatserani, and Vatserani, and they proposed a very beautiful algorithm that is called the ranking algorithm. So it's almost like greedy, but with one twist. And the twist is as follows. Before we start doing anything, we select a random permutation of the online vertices. Then when a vertex arrives, we select it to the first free neighbor according to this permutation. So here it will be the purple. Now the next guy comes, he tries with the first free neighbor, which is the purple, but it's already taken. So he goes to his next neighbor, which is the red, which is free, and so on. And if we do this first randomized step, the competitive ratio now becomes one minus one over E, which is strictly better than one half. And furthermore, this is known to be the best possible competitive ratio that even a randomized strategy can be solved. So to summarize, since 1990s, we have had a complete understanding of one side of vertex arrivals. If we want to have deterministic strategies, the greedy is optimum, it achieves a competitive ratio of one half. And if we allow for randomization, the ranking algorithm is optimal and it achieves a competitive ratio of one minus one. Three. But what can we do more? Well, it seems a little bit restrictive to only look at one side of vertex arrivals. So what about more general arrival models? You could think of, hey, in Uber, both the clients and the drivers arrive online and we need to match them. So you have two sided vertex arrivals. Vertices arrive online on both sides. So when a vertex arrives, you see the edges to already arrive neighbors and you need to make a decision. Maybe we run greedy, so we match it. But now other guys come. So guys come in both sides. If you think for a while, it's not hard to see that the deterministic greedy algorithm still recovers half of opt, so it's half competitive, and it's the best you can get with any deterministic strategy. However, it was open whether randomization could do better than one half, and we answered that question last year, and we proved that there exists a randomized strategy that covers strictly more than one half of opt, so one half plus a small constant at the moment. So it remains an interesting open work to get the better constant in this range. So this was for two side vertex arrival, but you could imagine even more general arrival model where edges arrive online. And arguably, I would say that this is the most natural model. So an edge arrives online and you need to make a decision whether to include it in your matching or not. So if we run the greedy algorithm, we will include this edge, but then we cannot include this edge because one of the neighbors is not free and so on. So again, this greedy algorithm will recover one half of opt in this more general model, and that's the best you can do if you're interested in deterministic strategies. However, it was open whether randomization could help, and here we also settled this question by proving that even if you allow for randomization, you cannot beat one half. 
So to summarize, we have analyzed the, somehow how good decisions can we do with limited knowledge about the future. And since the 1990s, we knew tight answers for one side vertex arrivals. Now we know that we can do better than greedy for two side vertex arrivals. And we also answer the questions for the most general case that here, in fact, greedy is optimal. So of course, I didn't get into the detail, details, but I would be more than happy to discuss these results and other results when you're at DeepFL. So at the end of this presentation, let me discuss a little bit about parallel algorithms for the matching problem. And this relates to the central question whether randomization significantly speeds up computation or not. Okay, so that's one of the, well, sorry. So we will come back to that. So we will look at parallel algorithms for the matching problem. And to be a little bit more formal, we think of parallel to be uh, problems that parallelize completely. So they can be solved in polylogarithmic time on polynomial processors. So this is a class MC, the class of problems that parallelize completely. So we can solve in polylogarithmic time on polynomial many processors. And one of the main open questions here are whether the matching problem is in NC. And the reason that we think of this as a very interesting question, or one of the reasons, is it's known to be in randomized ANSI since the 70s and 80s. So this means that if I allow my processors to flip random coins, then I can solve the perfect matching problem in polylogarithmic time on polynomial memory processes. And this is one of the unsolved mysteries of computer science, whether randomization actually helps to design efficient algorithms. First, it's tempting to say, yes, randomization has to help, right? Because there are many problems for which only efficient randomized algorithms are known. One example is polynomial identity testing, verify whether a polynomial is identical to zero or not. So a good example is, hey, if you have a determinant of some variables, is this polynomial identical to zero or not? There's a trivial randomized algorithm, just plug in random values and calculate the determinant. However, the best there's no deterministic even sub-exponential algorithm now. So the best deterministic algorithm will take exponential time. So at first you might think, hey, randomization must help in the design of efficient algorithms. But then, in fact, we believe that everything that we can do randomly efficiently, we should be able to do deterministically efficiently. And one strong indication is by Impagliazzo and Vigdorsson, who proved that if SAT has no sub-exponential circuits, then any randomized polytime algorithm can be made deterministic. But if this is true, then we should at least be able to de-randomize the randomized parallel algorithms for the matching problem. And in recent work, we make a step towards this, and particularly we prove that the general matching problem is in something called quasi -NC. This means that we can solve it in polylogarithmic time, but we use quasi-polynomial many processes instead of polynomial processes. There are many fascinating open questions here that I would love to discuss with you, uh, either through email or once you're at DPFL. And uh, with that, I would like to say thank you, and I look forward to see you at our beautiful campus.